Hey everyone. Uh, let me see. Let me stop the editing mode so I don't accidentally sit there and make everything while we're talking to you. Wow. Okay. So um, I don't know where to start. This has been a, a lot of fantastic work on the part of Facebook. Uh, everyone, uh, thank you everyone for coming. We did a whole lot of running around to get this to the last minute, so. Huh. All right. Uh, welcome everyone to the 206th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. This is uh, one of our special presentations. It is also, uh, we are working with, I guess, the Puppet Meetup. Uh, I just want to, yeah. Do you guys have a number for this? No, okay. <laughs> Uh, we try to keep track, I guess, um, it's just for us today. So today we are going to be hearing from uh, Daniel Lamar Garcia and Ivan uh, Nepis. Is close enough? Oh, okay. okay. I should have checked that first, as I said, running around. Um, but they'll be talking to us uh, with, a, uh, with a presentation titled uh, Foreman, uh, Latest Updates, uh, Puppet 4, Remote Execution and Discovery. Um, first, I'd like to say how much we appreciate Facebook for providing us with this space. Again, at the last minute, working so hard to make this uh, come together, it's been really, really amazing. Um, it's been really short notice. Um, and thanks to everyone who came out here. This was, again, short notice. Uh, thanks for uh, coming out. Without you, we can't put these on. Uh, we are here for you. Um, so, the normal things. Uh, turn off the noise makers. Um, that is your cell phones, devices, tablets, whatever might ring, beep, Google, whatever. Uh, second, uh, any snacks you have, please make sure they're not in noisy wrappers. And third, uh, I'm gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to have questions at certain points. Uh, I'll be up here with the mic. Just come on up, take the mic for a moment, ask your question. We want that so that uh, the video recording in the back will reflect your questions as well as the answers. Um, that'll make it so later on, uh, for posterity, people will know both sides. Um, so just so you know, our next meeting will be Wednesday, June 15th at Civic Hall. It'll be uh, Amir Chowdhury talking about unikernels, uh, and the title of the talk will be Unikernels, What Are They Good For? I think it'll be a really interesting talk. It's going to be talking from the perspective of, well, uh, probably a slightly different side of the world than the normal uh, Linux uh, focus we have. Um, I'd like to thank Facebook uh, again, as well as our regular space sponsor, Bloomberg, and acknowledge our other sponsors, past and present. IBM, Canonical, Randor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media uh, for their support, uh, as well as uh, Pearson. Um, in addition, Nylock would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly, and uh, as well as today, uh, in the past, as well as today. Uh, announcements section. Does anyone have any announcements they would like to make uh, about community events or anything coming up? Anyone? Okay. Uh, I will mention that the uh, call for papers and the registration for New York City DevOps Days 2016 will be opening real soon now. That will be actually happening September 20-something. But the call for papers will be in the next month, and uh, we will try to get that process going as soon as possible. So take a look at devopsdays.org if you are interested in presenting or if you are interested in attending. Um, for the uh, Nylog workshops, the next one will be in two weeks on the 14th, the day before our next presentation. That will be um, that will be at City College at 138th in Amsterdam, uh, June 14th, 6 to 8 p.m. And it will appear on the Nylog Meetup page very soon. And in case you missed it, there are Linux Distro DVDs on the butcher block table in the back over there. Take a look. If you were interested, take one home, use it, and uh, it's yours. After the presentation, we will be heading to Pop Pub at 88 University Place, that's between 11th and 12th, for drinks, uh, to talk, uh, to uh, say hey. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. Now, uh, as I mentioned, questions will be coming at predefined points where, um, where our presenters will be giving us uh, an opportunity to uh, feedback. Uh, please hold your questions until those points, uh, and that way we will get them on camera and get them for posterity. All right. Um, does anyone, again, last chance for announcements? No. All right, great. Well, everyone, thank you. Um, please welcome Daniel Lobato Garcia and Ivan Nekas. Did I decide on Nekas? Sorry. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, four of the latest updates Puppet Forum on Execution and Discovery. Thank you. Hey, guys. Thank you for coming. Um, also, thank you again to the organizers who really uh, did a good job. Uh, doing this so last minute. We really organized this last week, basically. <laughs> All right, um, so Foreman, uh, 112, what happened? Uh, this is the 
front page of theformman.org if you don't use it. Uh, what we're going to do today is basically I'll speak like for five ten minutes about uh, what what is it what we do, and then he'll uh, I'll tell you about what changes we make to support Puppet Four, but most of them uh, you don't really have to care about them. If you, if you use Puppet Four, it's going to work uh, transparently. And yeah, and after uh, Ivan is going to talk about uh, remote execution, which is a plugin that you should try uh, and changes that we've made in Discovery so that it works in networks that do not have uh, Pixie. All right, um, yeah, again, uh, foreman.org, if you have any doubt or questions or whatever, just go there and uh, check it out during the talk at any time. If you have any questions, you can ask us later. Um, all right, so what is foreman? As I said, this is going to be quick. Uh, just to get a feel for it, how many people here have used it or use it. Okay. Wow. Okay. So like 20%, maybe a little less. Okay. So uh, for those who don't use it, which is the majority of the people here, uh, it's a open source tool for managing the life cycle of your hosts. Uh, hosts being defined as virtual machines, bare metal systems, and it also has like a plugin for supporting the life cycle of containers. Um, what do we mean when we say life cycle? It's kind of a loaded word, word so it's uh, life cycle for us is this. It's uh, provisioning the host, which, mean, which means provisioning the host in a, in a cloud environment, like, I don't know, Azure or Google Compute Engine or, um, yeah, or Liver, whatever. Uh, configuration, which means configuring it with any any tool like uh, like Puppet, for instance, or it can be now Ansible, Chef, Salt, and monitoring. Which um, I guess we should we should change that one to reporting because that's mostly what we do. We basically report about what's going on on your inventory of hosts. Um, in case you're still confused because I haven't shown like any actual picture of, of, how, of what it is. Uh, we'll, we'll go into that in a moment. All right, um, so for provisioning, uh, as I said before, we support bare metal. Uh, I think that's kind of how the project started by solving that need of uh, having a data center and having to register hosts into an into, um, inventory. Uh, but it's also extended to a bunch of other uh, virtualization environments and cloud environments, like all what you can see there, and a lot more. I'm not going to list them all. <laughs> um, yeah, and also if you have like your own virtualization system at work, uh, there's this plugin system, this plugin framework that we have, which is basically uh, it's basically Rails but a little modified. Uh, if you don't, if we don't support some some virtualization system, you can just write a plugin for it and I guess like tell us about it if you do it because we can like take care of things like packaging, testing and so forth. Um, okay, that's for where you provision it. Uh, how you provision it, it can be uh, via Pixie, um, which means that when your machine turns on it contacts it contacts um, Pixie server and uh, get the definition for what it's supposed to do at start, or via an image, uh, which is the usual thing that most people do in in a cloud environment. And after we provision a host, uh, things like uh, DNS, DHCP, uh, sign, well, registering your host in a in an IPA realm, and everything else uh, comes together uh, for configuration and. Foreman doesn't itself, it doesn't do any configuration on, on its own, it's basically relying on all these tools. So what we do though is we provide a definition of uh, how a host uh, should look like. So let's say uh, I have a host and I want to have NTP on it, I want to have uh, Ansible installed on it, I want to have some SSH keys uh, in it. Uh, well. What Foreman does in this case is it gives the um, configuration management tool um, the definition. 
uh, we'll see it in a moment in, in action because uh, I think I'll be also confused if I, will, if I haven't seen it too. <laughs> Alright, and for monitoring, uh, we do things like uh, if your configuration failed and some hosts you get emails, uh, if, you're, if your hosts uh, are running uh, RHEL, uh, you can get uh, alerts about, let's say, some new CV comes up. Uh, if you have Catello installed, which is a plugin of Foreman, uh, we know the RPMs that are on your, on your system, so we can get uh, you can get them you can get alerts about new CVs that come up and patch them uh, really quickly. Um, same goes for things like OpenSCAP, which is a, a way of making sure security compliance policies uh, are enforced. And I think now I'm going to go into the brief demo. Okay, uh, there's like a bunch of enterprise things here, like LDAP integration and um, multi-tenancy. So if you have like multiple organizations in your company, some organization is, shouldn't be able to access someone else's hosts and so forth. Um, oh, and something that's kind of important if you have uh, more or less production level network is that all these things like the P Pixie servers, DHCP, uh, TFTP orchestration and all that, it all happens not in one host, it happens on what we call smart proxy, which is a host that is deployed uh, on one network to do these operations. And it, it's basically you need if you have segmented uh, networking. Okay, um, let's actually go into the demo now, give like a one minute introduction of the history of it, of the project. Uh, again, uh, the foreman.org, if you have any, any questions, uh, they're probably, there's probably going to be an answer in there. Alright, uh, so when you log in the foreman, what you see at first is this overview, which is a dashboard of what happened lately on your inventory. Uh, you see a few charts, like in here, 63 of my hosts uh, have no report, which means uh, it's kind of worrisome because none of them have run any kind of configuration in a long time. Um, has, what's like the limit? I think it's like two days or something like that. Uh, okay, well, uh, it, it, it's, it's configurable anyway. And yeah, uh, you can see that like in the last 30 minutes, no hosts uh, run anything. Uh, what happened? Like some tasks and. I also created like some VMs in a in a private network in this computer, and they were discovered. So we can see that uh, in the last 24 hours, I created this host uh, from 1996, apparently. Uh, yeah, so I can see this kind of thing. If I go and click and hit, let's say, um, I can uh, see the information about it, and if I'm okay with. With all of it, I can just click on provision and start provisioning the host. All right, uh, he's going to do a demo about how to do uh, this kind of discovery, but without uh, PXC server, which is kind of a, it used to be a hard requirement on Foreman. Okay, another uh, main screen of Foreman is like the hosts page, which is kind of your inventory, what I said before. Uh, it shows like the operating system, uh, the, um, all of the information that you that you have about your hosts, uh, and it shows this thing called a host group, which is um, it's kind of a template. I would define it as a template for how your hosts should look like. So if you let's say click on your host, and I want to create a new one, um, I'm going to be able to select a host group. And this is going to pre-select things like I want to deploy it in uh, network A or network B. It's going to get an IP address automatically. It just contacted uh, the DHCP server and saw uh, that 16 is free, so it contacted it. Uh, it also got a domain. Um, yeah, I can choose the operating system here, uh, choose a root, a root password, and so forth. Uh, an interesting part of this is the parameters tab and the top of classes tab. Uh, when you create a host, um, okay, not this one because it's okay now. So when you create a host, 
uh, what you can do is to define the puppet classes that you want to be, that you want to be run on the host. Which means uh, I I have like some groups in here like base Linux. It contains just a uh, setup of the Apple repo, firewall, message of the day, and these standard uh, library, which is it's basically a module that installs uh, kernel devil tools, I think. Right. So if I can click, if I click in here, uh, I might get okay. This one doesn't have any parameters. Anyway, if I click in here, uh, next time Puppet runs on this host. Uh, it's going to get a definition of the host that contains all these modules, and Puppet is going to uh, understand that that host should look like it and run it. So I'm going to show you, uh, in case you're curious, how that exactly looks like. All right. Um, so let's say this one. All right. Also, you get okay. This is, this is what it's called the external nodes, uh, YAML dump. It's basically what's provided to Puppet. So Puppet can read this YAML file and understand uh, how the host should look like. So this one doesn't have any classes, so it's, it's not going to do anything. If you have any classes in it, uh, you, you can pass these parameters and use them in your Puppet manifests. So if, if you have in, in Puppet manifest uh, domain name, it can read it from, from here and apply it in your manifest. Um, okay, um, that is basically all that I want to show you today about um, as an intro format. I think most people could get a feel of what it is uh, just by seeing this. Uh, you can do other things like get a console, or run a job, power the host on, this is one itself, and so forth. Uh, but I guess uh, it's best just to see it in action later with Ivan's demo, and and I'll try to explain a bit uh, what happened with Puppet 4. Um, oh, just one last thing. Uh, there's this thing called uh, provisioning templates, which is basically a repository. Sorry, a repository for uh, templates that you may use when you provision a host. So things like user data, if you have like a host in OpenStack and you want to create a new host in OpenStack, uh, you can uh, have your cloud in the templates uh, user data in here. And this is all written basically in ERB, which is Ruby uh, with, um, how's it called? Uh, it's basically you can interpolate variables from Ruby in here, and these variables come from the host definition itself. All right, um, so Puppet 4. All right, um, I don't have slides for that. Uh, this, it's not that interesting, but basically a uh, few points that I want to mention. Um, all right, so one thing is it supports uh, the all-in-one install. Uh, it's fine. It, right now, the installer is um, it understands that uh, your config files are going to be in uh, all Puppet Labs and so forth. Um, right now, the installer, uh, when you when you run it on, on a proxy, you will install Puppet for it. Uh, there are a few things that you can do, like uh, running, sort of setting future parser and stringify facts on your Puppet 3 puppet.conf. Uh, so you can set up these two things, uh, future parser and stringify facts in puppet.conf on puppet3 and then you'll see if the modules are uh, compatible or not. Um, other than that, uh, we don't really do like anything uh, with, with the new features. Uh, I just wanted to show one thing, like if you had a puppet3 and puppet4 master, they're different. Uh, well, you will see here, when you try to import your environments, you would see the list of, envir the list of classes uh, or environments that changed. Uh, you can, uh, well, you will see what was added and removed in each Puppet Master, so you don't need to, um, you don't need to have them in sync, right? So right now I see that 
if I try to sync my Puppet 4 master, it doesn't have a, uh, some modules, so I just decide not to update it. And same thing would go with um, if I had an, a, Puppet 3, a Puppet 3 master and I wanted to import it, uh, I would not get um, a Puppet 4 modules if I didn't want to. Um, as for smart variables and smart class parameters, uh, nothing really changed in there. Uh, classes are imported just the same. Uh, there's one, one thing that's uh, in the works right now, which is the static typing that, uh, that parameters can have now in Puppet 4. Uh, it's not read yet, uh, but it's not because of us, it's them. <laughs> It's the resource type API in Puppet 4. It doesn't return the type of the parameters. So if you want to override Puppet class parameters in Puppet 4, even if even if they're st statically, you say it like that, statically typed, <laughs> um, even if it's like that, you have to still come to uh, configure classes, choose the parameter, and choose the key type. Um, I I'll try to see if I can make the resource type API. Uh, return the um, the types of the of the parameters because that that would be useful for us. Um, yeah, and there's not much else. Um, there there are structured facts in Puppet Four which are the way they're imported right now. It's basically uh, the same way as with old facts. Um, like if you have a structured fact fact that has like several levels. Um, there's like a colon colon in between every level, but they're all imported in the same level. Uh, but since for Ansible, Salt, and Chef, uh, there are already structured facts support, uh, we should really look into how to uh, extract that from these plugins and offer it from format itself. And I don't think I have a lot more to say about uh, Pub4. Uh, Try it. If you see something that doesn't work, uh, notify us on the mailing list or the Redmine issue tracker. Or, or now if you saw something. Um, okay. Uh, now, uh, give it up to Ivan. <laughs> yes. Do you want to use it? Did you want to take questions at this point? Sorry, Ivan, did you say you want to take questions at this point, or do you yeah, want to wait? Yeah, I think it's a good time to take questions because, you know, if you want to see something open, I think right now. Okay. Well, while okay. I'm searching, does anyone have any questions? Like, here, please come on. Wait, here's a question. Come on. Hi, yes. I'm currently I'm running uh, Forward 1.7, and I know I have to do a, a few incremental <laughs> upgrades to get to 1.11. Do you have any... Uh, um, you know, just rules of thumb for how to get the clients from the agents from version 3.7 to, to public The agent, public agents, you mean? Yeah. Uh, okay, so first off, you would need to upgrade also the proxies uh, and foreman before you can upgrade the clients. Uh, for the clients themselves, it doesn't really matter. As long as your modules are compatible, um, it's going to find you, you just, I'll, I'll try to post it later, like maybe on Twitter or mailing list or something, I'll try to make a quick recap, but if you set up a few options, uh, I think they're, they're, they're written in the release notes for Puppet 4, but there are a few options on Puppet.com that allow you to see if your manifests would be compiled in Puppet 4. Uh, I think that's the only re recommendation that I can really give. And as for updating for man, uh, we don't support like jumping from for one seven to one twelve. So it's yeah, it's kind of a bumpy road. You would have to go one eight, one nine, one ten, one twelve. Well, one eleven too. <laughs> and yeah, and also the proxies. Uh, the proxy would be would be even more important because the proxy itself it's it's what it's what's calling the Puppet Four API to read the. Um, to read the, um, uh, how do you call it, the environments on the classes. So, so yeah, uh, actually you, you could do it, if I were you, I would try to do it like, first get the modules uh, to be compatible, then 
uh, start new as my proxy, like fresh uh, from from metal, like the uh, last version of the smart proxy that you, can, that you can find, which is compatible with the Papa 4 APIs. And yeah, and then uh, like an experimental format, or try to make the calls to the smart proxy yourself to see it works. But yeah, that's kind of my recommendation. I, I don't know if it's yeah, if I can recommend anything else. Sorry. Does anyone have any other questions? Come on, come on up to the front, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> or we're all coming around to you. Here you are. I didn't mirror before. Does this work? No. Yeah, I just had a quick question on on permissions. Okay. The what example you gave is great for somebody who's in dev and has full admin access. And everything. Do you have any segregation um, of certain types of permissions? Um, yeah. For example, sometimes certain groups can only have access to certain networking things. Certain groups can only have access to Windows. Like, Windows 80 or LDAP, other groups can only run applications, and so on. Right. Um, do you have format around in there? Um, okay. Is that your desktop over there? We have, we have the right input? It says, yeah. <laughs> Good more Brian. And so for permissions, uh, we have uh, actually a role-based authentication control. Um, all right. So. Something that you mentioned, like networking, you wouldn't be able to like prevent people from like deploying in a certain subnet, I guess. But there, there are things, there are things like you could like create what we call compute resources, uh, which is um, connection to your to your cloud provider or your virtualization provider, and you could create different compute resources. What what, what do you use? What Okay. Okay, but I mean, how how do you create machines in that cloud? It's it's not a. Uh -huh. Okay. I guess you would be like those machines are would be understood by four minutes like per metal machines. They would they wouldn't be much integration with the virtualization system because it's like custom made. Uh, so you would be doing things like what Ivan is going to show you now, like discover them in the network, then sign them up, and you can create rules like if a machine was discovered in this network, then uh, put in this organization or location or whatever, and then X, Y, and Z people have access to it, or groups, or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I can give you like a bit more of a deep dive on, on roles later if you want. Any other questions? Next question. Can I use, hi, hi uh, can I use Foreman for my rack switches, my networking devices? Um, some of them. <laughs> what, what, what do you use? So essentially, I'm wondering if it can replace, say, my CMDB system right now. Uh, CMDB, uh, okay. that's for your... Uh, content management, rather. Okay, what, what, does, what does that DB contain? I'm not, I'm thinking Basically, I'm my entire inventory of servers. For, I mean, for like registering things in it would be easy, and I know there's this uh, newspaper in Brazil called Globo who wrote um, what would they write uh, like support for A AIX and other like and some Cisco routers um, like in terms of getting them in there it would be definitely possible configuring them and getting reports from them it kind of depends on whether these things support any. Well, any environment where you could run like Python or Ruby or or something like that. Um, but yeah, for getting them there as in a DB and maybe like write comments about it and put like parameters if you want to import this DB and say, hey, this router was installed at this date and 
it needs this special thing, you, you can definitely do that. If it's just that, it, then then certainly yes. If you want to configure them, then it depends on the uh, piece of forward in particular. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the uh, the facts that you're providing. Is that something that, that is that a static file that you're laying down, or is there an API that that the client or the server, depending on the configuration management system, would access to to get those facts or okay grains or yeah holes or whatever. So it depends. Like it, like you said, um, s most of these come via Factor and and Puppet or. OHI or or Ansible fact or I'm I'm not sure how it's called like insult but grains or yeah they're called grains but I don't know how, where they yeah. come from. <laughs> um, well, I guess, I guess what I'm asking is, do you lay a file down? Is it remote access, or do you have an API that? Well, we have an API. To Can you go to like uh, API? And we also have a CLI for it, so you can like you you can write scripts that query this API or uh, just um, use the, the CLI that we have for it that's called Hammer. If you go to the format there, you'll see like a CLI, uh, yeah, a CLI link that it will tell you how to use it. It's basically you put your name and username and then you can query things a bit more easily. Is that like a, um, a Swagger UI or is it something of your own? Or? Uh, wait, it, it's not a new UI, it's like a CLI, it's on a console. So, oh, I see. Got it. Right, so it's like you don't have to write curl uh, past like SSL certificates and do all that kind of stuff. You just like write hammer uh, facts list and then like a search query. I don't know subnet equals one nine two one six eight zero zero and then you'll get facts for hosts in in there. Um, yeah, we can show you later if we have, if we have some time. All right, thanks. Anyone else? Last chance. All right, and I think we have the the author of the original author of the Hammer CLI that we have here. I think. Don't we? Do we? Do we? Yeah, I think Brian was the. Oh, back there. I think. Yeah, it was called Hammer. So he's the author of the name. So. Uh, okay, so uh, I will proceed to the second part of our talk. Uh, before we get to there, I'm really glad I made it here. You can notice at the top of the screen the time, the local time that I'm used to. So it's 2 in the morning in, for me. And I just traveled 4,000 miles. And I'm going to give a live demo, so what possibly go wrong? So we'll see. Uh, uh, also, I landed at 5 p.m. and I got here at 7 p.m. by uh, subway and train and everything. I think it, I made a new record. At least it felt for me that it was really fast and everything. Everything worked. Two so, hours from landing to JFK, uh, landing in JFK or to to here downtown. So yeah, it worked. Okay. I, I don't know how you know if I used to how fast to travel, but I'm, I'm pretty impressed. So uh, anyway, so we'll get to the uh, hands-on session here with just one hand because the other I need for microphone but uh, we'll try so I first will try the Pixilas discovery first of all I will ask you if you know how the Pixie boot and you know when you uh, auto provision with Pixie how it works it doesn't yeah okay so th that's why I will show the Pixilas one uh, and I'll, I'm also pretty confident that it should work because I don't have to care about the DNS and you know TFTP and all the other services that we uh, originally need to handle for that. So originally Foreman can handle the uh, alternate installations with Pixie, so we can handle the DHCP records. We can we can handle the TFTP so that when I provision a new host. The new TFTP record gets on, to, on the right place, so that when the machine uh, boots up, it just you know loads everything and everything just works most of the time. And but sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes uh, people have environments where they even don't want 
us to manage the, the DHCP or TFTP uh, services for various reasons. So that's where the uh, Pixelus discovery comes in place. So first thing is just the discovery itself because I think it's pretty amazing uh, project. It's a plugin into the format. So I will show how that works. I will simulate the bare metal provisioning here using my Libvirt, but you know, we can use some imagination here. So uh, I will simulate that I have a really hardware box that I've plugged in you know, either you know, CD or USB with some ISO, bootable ISO. ISO and I've prepared one ISO by my own or I used the uh, discovery plugin to generate one for me. So it's really small uh, image running CentOS 7 uh, with, you know, we try to minimize everything we could so that it doesn't take too much to load and so uh, I will try to boot from that and we will see how far we'll go. Uh, just you know, defaults are okay, whatever. I will use some same, same network for this purpose and this should be it. So the image started booting and uh, after it does it runs a, uh, a minimized version of some uh, distro and it will run the format proxy, the one that Daniel already mentioned. So uh, he mentioned at the architecture that we use the format proxy just you know to uh, kind of uh, heavy lifting or you know providing some API for external services so one of the APIs might be even controlling some external host so imagine you plugged your USB uh, into some new fresh hardware that you just bought and you are pretty happy that it will run something exciting so uh, you'll get the page like this and you don't even have to care about that, you know, you just plug it in your data center and walk away and what you care about is this page discovered host where this host just appeared, it's uh, something that also Daniel already shown, so this new box shown uh, there and uh, we can try to uh, provision, provision from that so the traditional approach would be we configure the TFTP and DHCP so that you know the uh, at the next reboot the uh, machine boots from the network it gets the right uh, configuration and, and boots. But since we don't have the DHCP and TFTP configured here, which I'm glad because it will break here for sure. Uh, so I will demo the Pixelets version where instead of the DHCP we uh, when I go and go to provision, uh, I can call it demo one. I will set. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Nyluk is okay. Uh, Nyluk is better. And my name is Nechas. If you want to try that somehow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but sure is not that hard, I guess. So, Nylog. Uh, so, uh, I, so, right now everything should be uh, prepared for provisioning and when I go back to my machine it should start doing something. So, instead of rebooting, it calls uh, write kexec uh, command so that we don't have to reboot and we just you know, start the new kernel and everything uh, on there uh, and the rest works as uh, the same as the Pixie Boot one. So when I go to, just to give you some overview, let me just increase the fonts. So when I go to how the uh, provisioning template looks like, uh, so it generates for us the kickstart file that it just gets boot in and you, you can see that it just started installing so, you know, what, what I tried or what I asked it to do. So uh, this is first thing that you can do with the pixels uh, or with the discovery itself. So it's really uh, bare metal as a service and it gets even uh, more interesting because you can do two things. When you prepare the ISOs for booting, you can build in some custom facts uh, to, to the to the image, so when I go and provision some more, I'll use this 
terminal and I have a nicely crafted command that should create another VM with the same and we'll look more into details of the facts because I, when I was preparing this ISO image I put there some custom facts and uh, when I switch by the way this is the uh, mobile version of the of the thing which I really don't orient in it's nice for demos uh, when you have no big screen uh, anyway so let me decrease the fonts nice. uh, so I will go to the, no, no thing here discover the host and we'll look at what facts we actually will have right when the uh, machine works yeah that's still a rule so thanks okay we have another one I have factory for VMs here which is nice so uh, what I did was adding some new fact uh, into the host called hello what else I could name it and nylac was the value for that so this is you know the value that uh, I put into the ISO you can uh, probably imagine what you could do is preparing different ISOs with that would just different in, in the facts values and I will show you how you can do, do uh, or use it later so I have here something that I can use and then we have the discovery rules where uh, I can set a new ro uh, rule here uh, where I will uh, search oh, sorry facts Hello. So I will search for this fact, and I will say that if a host with these facts uh, boots up, I want it to be in an ILAC uh, user group or a host group in this case. Uh, I can craft some uh, nice uh, host name for that. So in this case, I will use the uh, NILAC prefix and then the last part from the IP. Uh, using some regular expressions, which is, you know, you could do some more advanced Ruby here if you want it, but regular expressions are okay for now. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So what we just configured is when the, this machine boots up next time, it should automatically start provisioning it as you uh, described. So uh, I will need just to confirm uh, that I want this location and organization. Uh, and it says I need Brno as well. Brno is the city that I'm coming from, so we probably just want to show up where, you know, to talk about it. It's a really nice city in Czech Republic, in Central Europe. So, okay, now it, now it works. Uh, so, uh, so, let's see how it works. So, I can either see all the holes that match the rule. So that's one way to uh, look at that, and when I hit the auto-provision uh, all it should start doing the same but now I didn't have to select the host group again so it just used the rule to configure the host properly but what's even more interesting is when I spin up I can cancel that and spin up another host with can I go to home? no ok, control A almost there uh, so I will use number 2 so when I spawn another VM again, it will again boot the discovery image, but immediately the foreman will apply the rule based on the facts there and you will start provisioning. So you don't even have to go to the foreman, you just plug the, the USB or CD or what you are used to, probably USB, and uh, let it do its work. Yeah, so magic. So that's probably you know, the that's the core part of the uh, discovery plugin, and what was added later was the pixels thing. So using the K exec 
so that we don't have even have DFTP and DHCP there. So I have now three VMs installing something, so I will probably kill my uh, laptop soon. Uh, so let me uh, force off everything I can. And uh, that's one part of my demo which worked pretty well. And so I will leave questions for this first. Are there any questions? Questions? Questions, questions? Okay, we um, gotta come on up. Or, or, <laughs> or, or you can... Uh, or if you want us to repeat it, or... We have many questions. Okay. okay. Yeah, so in this case, so the question was if that's a pixelless boot, if it's always from some bootable media, uh, you could configure your DHCP also to boot just this static ISO if you don't. So if you have a DHCP network that you don't want for man control, or you know you have some co corporate one that no nobody lets you touch, you know it's another service that somebody would need to care about. So you instead would ask them just to configure the bootable image there. So no dynamic thing there, and we'll, you would then control the rest. So it's not limited just to, to the USB. Okay, so that's one question. And one was... Uh, oh. uh, two questions. One is, um, do you, does it use uh, the native Pixie or can it use iPixie? Uh, there are multiple web providers uh, for that, uh, which I can probably show in the provisioning templates. Uh, it's partition templates, I was doing it wrong. Uh, when I search for Pixie, I hope I could find something. Uh, this quick thing. Yeah, I'm still in partition because I'm sorry. So, we have even FreeBSD. Uh, it's kind of mixed it, uh, with the... Uh, uh, so it's Pixie, I, I think iPixie was there as well. Maybe Daniel, you can... Uh, Um, okay, uh, yeah, okay. So my, my other question, totally different uh, question. Um, how good is integration, or do, does it integrate with um, uh, commercial VM cluster servers like uh, VMware and Hyper-V? Okay, so we have uh, integration with uh, vSphere, and it's, you know, all these providers, we have integration also for uh, Overt or Rev, uh, for Libvirt and others, and uh, they are on the similar level. You can uh, sometimes we hit the limitations of the folk library that we use you know, at, at the back end. So, uh, for some more advanced stuff, we sometimes need to first send patches to folk to support this case and then uh, use, use the VMware, but it's still you know, involving and it depends on which cases our users uh, usually hit. So, but, but we have a large user base on, uh, around the, the Wisfield. Hyper-V, was it? So is there a support email? Let's speak here to leave you the microphone. Okay. So, yeah, we did a survey about uh, doing Hyper-V versus uh, Microsoft Azure, um, because it seemed like there was like an overlap of people that used uh, one or the other, and it was like 75 uh, Azure and the rest Hyper-V. Do you use Azure? No? Okay. So yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, Hyper-V, we didn't do it, and um, I wouldn't say it's not on our roadmap, but it's not in any in the near future, yeah. Especially since we just did the Azure thing, it was just, it was just basically we can do both. So, how difficult is it again to add support? So uh, maybe you can show it here. You have internet. 
Okay, uh, so yeah, it's 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 alright. It's alright. It's on the forum there is uh, there is a way of sorry a tutorial for creating plugins. If you have someone that knows a little bit of Ruby, uh, it really isn't difficult, and we can help you out. We're all day on the Fortman and the Fortman dash dev uh, IRC channels. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, if you're really interested in making a hyper view, we'll help you. Do you program? Yeah. We, we accept patches. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I, everybody laughs about it, but seriously, you know, we plug in, plug it in, use the pluggable model that Foreman has. And it's not that complex to at least add the rudimentary pieces of this. So, um, you know, go for it, you know, and then you're, we'll put your names in the lights and stuff and probably give you a free hat or something. All I'm going to say is if you got vSphere working, you can probably do anything. Um, uh, anyone else have questions? Uh, so, so, again, I was, like, very, very confused about a number of things. Uh, new, new question, what is k-exec? Uh, so, and when, when does the k-exec happen? So you, you've done a boot, and then you're issuing a k-exec Instead of the re reboot? Yes, that, that's it. The, the running, service running that the foreman can communicate to, and when I hit the provision uh, through the API, it tells the service run the case. Okay, exactly. Okay, second question is um, this whole thing about changing an ISO. I mean, I, the, there wasn't enough time for you to write an ISO. Okay. Right? You know, so, I mean, you said you're, you're, instead, you're somehow rewriting the ISO that's doing the reboot, but Boy, it's felt really fast that ISO really got rewritten. Uh, I can show you how, how you can. Uh, it's the reinstall. install. Let's set certain memory was. Because I have everything in my history. So it's. It's called cache. Okay. So, to say it. It does, doesn't mean it ran a sync at the end, right? So, if I wanted to create, so I don't know if the question was about creating a new ISO? Uh, yeah, no, I, I had prepared one, but I can show you how I can create a new one. So, uh, this is the command that we provide, the discovery master that uh, Ripple also provides the build that I saw for you, and what I change here, you know, is the that I will change the hello effect to the Nylog one, and I can show you how fast that is. As, as long as I write my password. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Right. Yeah, so it's not that complicated. So five megabytes from a set, uh, CentOS, would you say? Uh, yeah, it uses the CentOS. Right, right. It's just in order to do a second stage bootload afterwards, right? Or third stage or fourth or whatever. We have one question uh, at the back. Yeah, let me get you the microphone here. So on the topic of ISOs, are they stored locally? Where where are they? If you want to upload a new operating system, so how do you do that? Yeah, it, it depends. You can really create you know, the bootable USB from the ISO, or you can configure. For example, they often use it in vSphere, where they don't have the DHCP, so they just say when create the VM, configure boot from this ISO. I, I did the same when I uh, used the libvirt. I choose at the beginning boot from the ISO. So it, uh, it's similar to when you have the, let's say, this distro ISO that you want to install from, but instead of using the official uh, ISO from the distribu distribution, uses, you use this small ISO that boots this discovery image. So that's, that's really it. Um, may I ask if you also offer, uh, uh, not to compare too much with other things, but for instance, like Cobbler, a lot of the features built into that are to mirror repos that try to keep that up to date. Is that something that you have a tie-in to maintain? Oh, you, you also do that. Yeah, More similarly. So, so I can show the. Uh, I'm I'm 
afraid I would broke my whole next demo, so I don't want to do that. Uh, I had a bad experience with connecting to different networks over demo. Okay, yeah, I'm just curious which one. Okay, so uh, if you know Spacewalk, anyone knows Spacewalk here? Spacewalk, you know? Okay. So Catalog provides, uh, Catalog is a plugin into the format that provides similar functionality, so it allows to synchronize repositories and provide a local copy, having control over the updates and errata if, if, they use, if you use them. And uh, in the cobbler, I guess the question was regarding uh, some, uh, let's say, installation me media. So that's one thing that we have there. So you don't have to uh, provision just from ISO, but you have you can have pre-configured different endpoints for these different uh, operating systems. And uh, at the core, there are the provisioning templates, where uh, you basically then can use, let's say, we have uh, big uh, Debian uh, user base. We also package the uh, the project into Debian, and I think for BSD as well. If I'm not, not, not okay. But I, I've seen some, you know, the ports thing. I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, at least we have the pre-seeds uh, uh, templates. We have the Kickstart, of course, we have the uh, BSD as well. So it really depends on your imagination and if the thing that you feed, or it's always about providing the right uh, line in the Pixie so that you know, the kernel boots with the parameter, whether it's pre-seed or Kickstart, and we can produce the uh, templates for anything that you, that you want. I'm sorry, does KXF work in booting? It only works with other Linux kernels, right? That's not going to be able to boot with other operating systems, is it? Uh, there's basically two layers there. So when I show back the, the one host that I provisioned... So, sorry, yeah, I don't mean to confuse things. I'm just not familiar with the full capability. So if it is, that's great. I just uh, am not sure. Yeah, me neither. So I'm uh, primarily a Ruby and a Rails developer, so it's like I, I try my best to understand these things as well. But, uh, so what I can just show is at the demo machine we have different templates for different things. So I can see what, how the k-exec uh, thing looks like. So this is what we send to the forum proxy on the discovery so that it runs the k-exec with some uh, parameters that we provide here. Uh, so that's one stage, one that's uh, run, it loads the uh, the provisioning template itself. So this is you know, the uh, pass to the Anaconda in, uh, and it can be passed to Presid and, and others as well. Uh, if you use uh, Pixie instead, uh, this is what the Pixie configuration looks like. So configured in, on your TFTP. So it's pretty similar to what, what Cobbler does. I don't know Cobbler that much that I could compare one to one, but you should be able to achieve uh, similar things with this. Great. Does anyone have another question? Yeah. Oh, we have two. I'm gonna. You asked yours. I'm gonna go over here first. Here you go. So even with the um, small ISO, you still have to have DHCP on the network, right? No. Okay. I don't have to. But like, I can, but I don't have to control that over format. So that that's the key difference. So. I can have the DHCP just for the host to have some IP at the end, but Foreman doesn't need to know anything about this DHCP service. So traditionally we control the DHCP so that when the uh, host boot it, we reserve the IP for them. Uh, we also hold it based on the MAC, MAC address. Uh, we configure the TFTP, we can even configure the DNS so that you know the uh, uh, name translation works and this kind of thing. So we can do a lot of things when you give us the permission to control the DHCP, TFTP and DNS. But in case you don't give us this permission, you can still use format for what's built for. With the discovery plugin though, you, it still has to be able to obtain an IP on its own. Right, the ISO doesn't have one pre-provisioned in it. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I follow. If you use the discovery ISO, you still have to have uh, 
an IP on there if you if you don't have DHCP at all, right? Yeah, you. Okay. I, I guess I, I think there is even option to you know kind of pre-configure that so that you don't uh, need the DHCP at all. But I. I'm not sure how it works. So, so you're suggesting maybe if you were going to attach physical media that you would have to pre-configure those in the HTML. Yeah, so one thing that I haven't mentioned, I'm not sure if I have... So quickly I, I can do what uh, how many hosts I need. I didn't just scroll at the beginning. Can I, I know, can I how many minutes? gigabytes do you have in the laptop? So I destroyed some. So one thing that the discovery image even provides is the uh, TUI. So if you want to configure something additionally, uh, I haven't played too much uh, to that. I would need to ask uh, a colleague of mine to come here to you know, give the really deep dive. But we have also deep dives recorded on our YouTube channel if you are interested more into uh, how it works. So ah, maybe I, we can put a link uh, to that in the video so yeah. you can make sure you get those to us. We can. And the auto provision was faster than me, so I wasn't able to show you the uh, the TUI. But there is really an uh, ability to configure these things that you asked for. So it'll prompt you if you if you hit it in time, so you can manually configure it. Uh, yeah. All right. Does anyone? Uh, you had another question. Here we go. It's it sort of, sort of a big thing. Uh, since you started it, uh, maybe uh, uh, at some point you can give me the links or some talk a little bit about the the because uh, we've been doing a lot about plugin API. You know, just you know, like at some point you'll have like a little bit of like if you really want people to get involved, like yeah. where, where to go. So what, is, what what does it look like? So the, the uh, really I don't have internet here, but when you go to the, the form and org, there should be you no. Know, um, the links to anything, everything that's needed for, for this kind of work. Yeah, I, I can show it like right after when you finish it, I'll put my computer here with the URL and uh, you can see it. There's like a community section that you can read and it tells you how to contribute, how you can write a new plugin and all that. And if you care about licensing, it's all GPL 2 or 3. Um, so I think, are you signaling that you have a question? Okay, yeah, I think we're about to move on to our, uh, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes. I will say, normally we would have books here and a giveaway today, we are dry. So, um, however, I, I did ask uh, Even and Daniel to um, have questions. Would you all like to do a trivia thing just for the bragging rights? Should we try it out? All right, great. Do you have your review questions? I have questions all regarding the part of the demo that I haven't shown. <laughs> Let's do it. That's more challenging. Okay. That might bypass some people's note taking. Oh, yeah, I, I can. I can give you. Um, we don't. Uh, I, it's, it will break. We will just break the internet. And since there's nothing at stake, I'm going to say shout it out okay. this time. Go for it. it. Just okay. Just so have fun. I will have questions about the formatting of execution. Uh, so, one question is, what connects to the remote host when you use the form and remote execution? So, first thing is, which tool we currently use for the remote execution? We have someone in the back. Who's that? Go for it. SSH. SSH, okay. SSH, all right. First point. <laughs> all right. I'm not sure if I'm right. 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 The, the, the second point. So, maybe somebody else. What service actually SSHs to, to the remote hosts? TLS. TLS? Like uh, the service or process. You know, you uh, so have there's a process that starts up, you're saying? I'm sorry? So you're saying there's a process that starts up and then initiates the connection? Yeah. Oh, we have uh, the same. Hey, Brian, go for it. I think it's smart proxy. Yes, it's it smart proxy. So you have the disadvantage that you haven't seen the talk, but. Well, that's how the life works. Uh, so yeah, what we do, so I will use these questions and answers to really talk about the remote execution, so I like it. Uh, so what, what we really use is, when I, I need to show the demo, I'm sorry. I, no, I can't. I don't have this one. Go for it. Uh, okay, so we can improvise here. So what we really do when you, so remote execution is really about, you know, uh, one of the things you need to do really about something to some hosts, usually it's updates, but you can do other things. We don't recommend, recommend it for using it for config management. We, there are tools for doing 
proper config management and no convergence and everything, but sometimes you really have to trigger one of the job, even if it was puppet run. What am I supposed to show? Uh, just some remote execution command on several hosts, if you have some. Okay. Um, okay. So there's a thing. Uh, oh. There's a thing called uh, job templates, which basically contain the well, the definition of what you're okay. Well, which one you want to show? Well, it, they contain basically what you're going to run in a host. Uh, in this case, uh, it would run system CTL, and then an action and a service. It's basically a templating language that understands what your host is and basically characteristics of your host, and then acts on it, um, well, depending on them. So if, if you were to run the script on a Red Hat host, it would run systemctl. If it was not Red Hat more than six, it would just run the old service. You want me to run this on some host, okay. Uh, well, I guess I can just run command. I don't know if I have like more than one host on, but anyway. Um, so, uh, well, uh, you are saying it. So, what we do really is we provide this SSH. We have the architecture done is architecture done in the way that we are not dependent on SSH. So, uh, we'll add probably some message based provider soon mm -hmm. because not everyone is like happy to see SSHing something SSHing somewhere. It's like you know, it triggers something in you know, some fight or flight instinct. <laughs> Uh, in some settings. So, uh, but even for SSH, uh, we try to not be you know, centralized in a way that the main form and service would do the work, but we can you know, overcome some obstacles of networking where the main server would not even be able to connect to the SSH. So what you would need to deploy the format proxy, again, that's you know, one part that we kind of integrate heavily with, and you can deploy that on your subnet and then the only thing you need is connection between the main server and the foreign proxy. You can also use that for uh, load balancing uh, or heavy lifting. So if you have multiple or too much to handle for one uh, process or uh, VM for SSH, you know, it can happen. So we can spawn multiple ones and we can uh, distribute this load. Also, when something uh, some proxy is down, we don't care. We just know okay, it's down. We will not use that. And one. Uh, so we have there also ability to set the execution to the future or set the recurring actions, so kind of ground like of, like thing. And another interesting thing is being able to control the concurrency level. So for example, if you run YAM update, uh, if you had 1,000 hosts or thousands of hosts, you could uh, quite easily just go uh, or send your infrastructure down because it will not be able to handle that. So we can spread the load across some display time or we can set the concurrency level so that it just you know goes one after another. So there's a lot of uh, features built in uh, in this simple feature and the most important thing is that it's also just a plugin which is kind of a you know, showcase of what you can do with plugins in Fork. So that's really I just need to talk about it. Yeah, so um, you answered your own question. Great. Yeah, yeah. Do we have another question? I, I, I can just, no, and if I plug, <laughs> unplug this and plug this, we should have, again, no, I, I spent a lot of time with the demo, I really uh, would hate not to show you because it's, it's awesome. <laughs> I, I guess this will wrap up the, the yeah. trivia. So, I think I think this is great. I don't think we need to ask for one unless you want to. Okay, so I prepared. So I have some. Uh, uh, I pretend them to be VMs, but they are really Docker containers with SSH uh, because I don't want to run ten VMs here. Uh, so I have here a simple script. That's exactly what you would use the remote execution for because I knew that I will not have the internet here. And I have the Docker images with CentOS images that they point to the you know internet to get all the things done. And I know that so I have here my local uh, uh, endpoint that I've just you know mounted some ISO, 
and I want to temporarily configure my VMs to, to use that for installing something. So what I can do uh, is uh, back to here and run this script uh, on the clients that I want and I want them uh, to run them on the foreman host. I can quickly check that there should be 10 hosts in there and execute it now and uh, it's running so you can watch the progress here. So no output because what? But everything. Yeah. But the next thing we can do is use the very same host, but now reinstall something on there once we have the, the VMs. So I will choose the package action uh, and I will say that I want to install what else than the ZSH and execute it now. I'm sorry? Uh, I have my local uh, mirror of the uh, CentOS uh, images, so you can just see that it, it was too fast to show the progress, but even we can even show you know, the live updates of that. Uh, and for the more advanced stuff that I was talking about, uh, you can even say in the advanced fields that I want, let's say, the concurrency level set to 2 and when we examine the execution itself again uh, you can see that it started kind of uh, one by one or two by two so not executing immediately Is that your... Yeah, yeah, I mentioned that that you don't want to the, the, the obvious one is you don't want really to overload uh, your network you might find other, so it might be kind of a solution also for the HA that you don't want to turn everything off uh, at once, but we, we can add more uh, that we are not there yet, but it still can be used for that. Do you have um, an API or a, a, a yeah. bus where you can follow where this data is coming from, where you can track the successes and failures as they go along? And, the record of uh, past jobs and such. Yeah, the, all, all the things that we we have here are tracked in the in the jobs. Uh, so we we have the data. I know uh, what, what happened, where it happened. Uh, we can also do things when you have something that failed. So just some host could fail. So there's ability to rerun just the failed ones. And, you know. So it's. Uh, we started with the development last year, and we can, you know, we, we are still uh, in iterations to make it better. We look that, that's why we are talking about that because we are also looking for the feedback. So uh, don't worry, give it a try. The remote execution itself doesn't need Puppet, doesn't need anything. It just needs the format, the proxy, and the SSH. So uh, it might be something interesting to play with. So uh, I think we're coming to the end of our time. I'm going to suggest that if uh, anyone has further questions, please call on out. We're going to go to uh, pop up after this over on University between 11th and 12th. Uh, have a couple of drinks. Come say hello. Ask your questions there. Thank you very much, Ivan and Daniel, uh, for the talk today. Thank you very much.